This is multivariable calculus, and in this video, I'm going to talk about section 14.6. And the topic of this section is uh, really two topics, directional derivatives and the gradient vector. Those are two very, very closely related ideas, so we'll get into that a little bit. Um, the idea of a directional derivative is that when we're, especially we're primarily thinking about um, working in a three-dimensional space. So a lot of times, um, you know, we've been talking about getting the rate of change in the x direction or the y direction or the z direction. But a lot of times you want to know uh, the rate of change of a function in a different direction along a certain path. So if you're going, you know, at some angle along your function, you know, how fast is the function value changing when you approach from that uh, direction? So that's what a directional derivative is. And so you can see on um, this diagram here, we've got this surface and on this surface we're trying to find what's the rate of change as we move along in the direction of this tangent line that is not in the x or the y direction so it's in a little bit different direction so the idea behind this is actually very simple um, it still works in the sense that we are thinking about the definition of a derivative but we're doing the definition of the derivative in the direction of the vector that is defining the direction we want the rate of change in. So you can see um, with this um, definition of derivative, you can see right here, we're saying the derivative in the direction of the vector u. And the rest of this pretty well looks the same as what you're familiar with. Now, in the end, what ends up happening is we don't really take the derivative that way, obviously, because we're not going to work out the definition of derivative every time we take a derivative. But in the end, what ends up happening is we can take our partial derivative in the x direction and multiply it by essentially the magnitude of the i component for that direction vector. And then we can take the y component of the direction or the y direction vector and we can multiply it by the y component of that direction um, vector. So it's fairly simple to do. Um, and, you know, in terms of actually solving these out, there's it's just a little bit of an extension of what we've already been doing. OK, so as we look at this first example, the thing that I want you to remember as we work through these problems is that um, Really, the, the idea behind this is what the important part is. The actual mechanics of solving this out is very simple. I could take, you know, probably a calculus AB student who has some basic derivative skills and they could go through and they could, you know, complete this process. The harder part is understanding what does that actually mean? And so for this problem, we have this function um, f of x is x, y. It should say find and interpret um, the derivative. Um, the partial derivative in the direction of u for the function at the point 1, 2, and using the unit vector, root 3 over 2i and 1 half j. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to start with our partial derivatives. So if I get my x partial, it would just be y, and if I get my y partial, it would just be x. Okay, so those are my partial derivatives. Now, I need those at the specific point. So the x partial at the point 1, 2, is obviously just going to be 2. The y partial at the point 1, 2 is just going to be 1. Okay, so those are the values that we're going to use. So now if I want this directional derivative that goes in the direction of the vector u <clears throat> of this um, function at the point 1, 2, all we're going to do is take our um, partial derivative and multiply it by the magnitude of the directional derivative in the i direction. So 2 times root 3 over 2 plus now we have our y partial times the y component of our directional derivative. So in the end, what we have here is our partial derivative, um, our directional derivative, I should say, um, in the u direction of this function 1, 2 is just going to be root 3 plus 1 half. OK, so that's the easy part, right? Understanding um, how to do that. But the second part is, what does that actually mean? Now, what that means is, if I were to look at the rate of change of this function, so we're kind of thinking along the lines of, you know, how fast is the function changing value if I move in the direction of the vector u? So that's what the important part is, is now I can see the rate of change 
not just in the x direction or just the y direction. I can do this in any direction that I want as long as I follow this process. Okay, so let's take a look at another example. It says find the directional derivative of this function at the point negative 2, 0 in the direction of the unit vector that makes an angle of pi over 3 with a positive x-axis. So what I want you to do is pause the video, take a minute or two, um, solve through that question. When you come back, I'll go through the solution. Okay, so here's my solution for that one. Hopefully you found that the magnitude of the directional derivative um, in the direction of the vector u at the point negative 2, 0 is negative square root of 3. But just looking at the process here, you can see I have my x partial, I have my y partial. I evaluated those each at the point negative 2, 0. And you can see we got 0 in the x direction, and we got um, a rate of change in the y direction of negative 2. So I've looked at my unit vector um, in the direction that I'm looking for, the direction of vector u. And remember, it says it makes an angle of pi over 3 with a positive x-axis. So when they talk about that, we're kind of thinking about, OK, this is in the xy plane. We're defining the direction of this vector. So that means that the x direction, or my i component, would be cosine pi over 3. My y component, uh, or my j component, would be sine of pi over 3. So we get 1 half root 3 over 2. And then same process. Take the um, x partial, multiply it by the i component, uh, the magnitude of the i component. Take the y partial, multiply it by the magnitude of the j component, and you can see we end up with negative square root of 3. Okay, so again, that means that if I'm looking at this function and I'm going in the direction of that unit vector, that's the rate of change of the function in that direction. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple other things here. So we also have this idea of a gradient vector. And first of all, let's talk about the gradient vector. And we're starting to get to the point where progressing beyond what we're looking at in this course starts to get into a lot of linear algebra. And so this gradient vector is an idea that starts to show up in a lot of higher level mathematics. So understanding what the gradient vector is, um, is going to be something that's really, really important if you're going to continue on into, let's say, differential equations um, and start to get into applications of differential equations. If you're going to get into a lot of higher level calculus problem solving, there's a lot of things going on with gradient vectors. So the thing with a gradient vector is, is it's just basically a vector um, form of all of your partial derivatives shown for your particular function. So for example here, let's say I have a function of x and y. My gradient vector, and this notation that you see, this um, sort of upside down triangle, it's the reverse of when we use a delta, it's just flipped. So this is the gradient of the function xy. So this is just basically my x partial and my y partial. That's what the gradient vector is. Now, we can have more um, variables that our, that our function is dependent on, and the gradient vector just starts to have more and more components to it. So this is actually really simple to do. OK, so in the end here, what this is is a, a good shorthand notation um, for us to represent all of the partial derivatives of the function. Now, we can also use that as a way of finding the directional derivative, just like we were looking at before. You can see the directional derivative here in the direction of vector u. I know this didn't print out or uh, copy the best, but this is, this is supposed to be a vector, um, a unit vector in the direction of u. And if we do that gradient vector and dot it with the um, directional vector u, then that's just going to take each of our partials and it's going to multiply by the magnitude of the unit vector for each one of those particular components that we're interested in. So actually doing the directional derivative, if you go back to those problems that we looked at a minute ago, like for example this one, here are the components of my gradient vector. My gradient vector would be y comma x. And then the dot product of that vector with uh, my unit vector, I would have done, you know, when we do a dot product, you just take the components that are corresponding and you multiply them together. So notice here, this was multiplied to this. And so in the end, we've already done that. It's just that now we're thinking about it in terms of defining a gradient vector. Okay, so here's another example that I want you to try. It says, find the directional derivative of this function at the point two negative one in the direction of um, vector v 
which is 2i plus 5j. And so what I want you to do is I want you to find the gradient vector first and use the notation for the gradient vector. And then once you have that, go through and do your dot product and you can solve that out. So take just a couple of minutes and solve it. Now, keep in mind when we do our directional vectors, this needs to be a unit vector in the direction of vector V. So make sure you turn that into a unit vector before you perform your dot product. And then that way um, you won't be getting extra magnitude in there that should not be. Okay, so pause the video, take a couple of minutes, work through that. And when you come back, I'll show you the solution. Okay, so here's my worked out solution for that. Um, you can see that I've got my uh, gradient vector F. And again, notice the notation that I use, the upside down triangle. And it's just the X partial and then the Y partial. And then I evaluated the unit, or excuse me, the gradient vector at the point two, negative one. And I got negative four and eight for the two components. And now if I wanna find my directional derivative in the direction of the vector V, this is the slight change that I have to do. So I have my gradient vector here, but remember V is not a unit vector. So I wrote down the unit vector in the direction of um, the vector V. And then from there, we're just performing the dot product and you can see we get 32 over the square root of 29. So that would be the exact rate of change in the direction of the vector V. Okay, so pretty simple to do. Um, and again, the main thing is not so much the execution of the steps of the problem. It's really making sure you understand what does this all mean. All right, so like I mentioned earlier, when we are talking about more variables, the nice thing about um, the gradient vector is that I can work with as many variables as I want. And all I'm going to do is add more components to my gradient vector. And you can see here, we're looking at the directional derivative and the gradient vector, and everything's exactly the same as what we had before. Here's the definition of my uh, directional derivative. And you can see that it's essentially the, de the definition of derivative now with you know three components. And when I look at my gradient vector, you can see I have three partial derivatives this time. So I have i, j, and k. And then if I want that directional derivative in the direction of the vector u, I can just do the dot product. So exact same thing with more components. And we can add more and more components to this. So with three dimensions, we're usually talking about motion, but we have a lot of you know real life situations where we have functions of more than three variables and we can still use um, the same idea with the gradient vector. The directional derivative probably doesn't make as much sense when you get into like four, five, six, seven um, variables. But at the same time, um, you know, the gradient vector gives us a really good quick shorthand notation where we can represent all of those first partial derivatives. Okay, so let's take a look at another example here. It says um, we've got f of x, y, z is x sine y, z, and it says find the gradient of f and find the directional derivative in the direction of this vector v. Now, again, note that this is not a unit vector. So we've got to take that into account when you work through it. So I'm going to let you work through this one. You can pause the video. When you come back, I'll show you the solution. Okay, so here's the solution um, that you should have come up with. Now, there is sort of a minimal amount of work that I will require you to show on problems like this. And what I have here is really um, mostly what I would want to see. You can see I've got, I've actually shown my gradient vector. I found the gradient at the particular point, one, three, zero. Um, I actually did it as a separate step where I actually showed my unit vector this time. It, the, I called it the vector u, and it's just the vector v divided by its magnitude. And then from there, we know we're doing a dot product. So um, you don't necessarily have to show the dot product step where everything's all plugged in, but I did show what my process was here. So this is the important thing. I need to see the process. I know a lot of this with the steps, especially when you're doing those computation steps, you don't need to show all your work, especially on something like this one where you've got zero multiplied to two of the terms. So there's really not a lot of work to show out. I, I don't need you to show me every single little computation. I just need to see the key steps in the process. Okay, so again, remember what that means is that we've got a function of three variables here. So, you know, um, when we start talking about a function of X, Y, and Z, we're sort of looking at a four-dimensional situation. And so when we're talking about a directional derivative, 
uh, it gets a little bit more complex in terms of what are we talking about, but we're talking about a derivative, or excuse me, a direction that's now defined in XYZ space, as opposed to um, a derivative that's defined in the XY plane. So keep that in mind. Okay, so let's talk about this idea of maximizing the directional derivative. So when we talk about maximizing the directional derivative, you can see we have this theorem here. And this theorem, there's a proof in the book. We'll talk about this a little bit in class. But the idea is um, when we are trying to maximize our directional derivative, so we're kind of looking at, okay, we have this function at a particular point. What direction do I need to move to have the maximum rate of change? Where is it, move, where is it changing direction the fastest? And so if we look at the um, directional derivative and we want to maximize that, it's going to have the magnitude of the gradient and it's going to point in the same direction as the gradient vector. So all we really have to do, if we want to know the maximum um, directional derivative, then we just need to go through and we need to find the magnitude of um, that particular gradient vector at the point we're interested in. And then we can find from there, we can find what direction um, the gradient vector is going to point in by just finding its magnitude. So let me go through this one with you because this sounds more confusing than it is. Okay, so on this problem, it says let f of xy be x squared e to the y, find the maximum value of a directional derivative at negative 2, 0, and find the unit vector in the direction in which the maximum value occurs. Okay, so I'm going to start by finding my gradient vector. So my gradient vector here would be 2x e to the y. Okay, and then that's my uh, x partial. And then my y partial would be x squared e to the y. Okay, so there is my gradient vector. Now, I want that gradient vector evaluated at the point uh, negative 2, 0. And when I plug everything in, that gives me the components negative 4, 4. So essentially, my rate of change in the x direction is negative 4. My rate of change in the y direction is 4. Okay, so now if I want to know um, the maximum value of the directional derivative, then all I have to do is find the magnitude of that gradient vector at the point we're interested in. So here's my magnitude. And in this um, particular case, I'm just going to get essentially negative 4 squared plus 4 squared. So I'm going to have 32 um, divided by its magnitude. Or excuse me, I just want the magnitude of this. So I'm just going to get the square root of 32. I'm not worried about the unit vector just yet. So I just have to do the x squared plus the y squared and take the square root of it. That's where the squ um, square root of 32 came from. Or we could write that as 4 root 2. But that's the max value of a directional derivative. And if I want to know what direction is that going to point in, well, if I want to know, okay, what is this direction that I'm looking at, all I have to do is take my gradient vector at the point I'm interested in and divide it by its magnitude at that point. Because I'm looking at the vector, that's the gradient, and when I take a vector and divide by its magnitude, it gives me a unit vector. So some of this stuff is, you know, going back to things we did way back at the beginning of the year. Um, but in the end, now we're using it in sort of a much more powerful way. So this is what that unit vector is going to look like, negative 1 over root 2, and then 1 over root 2. So that's the direction of the maximum uh, the maximum directional derivative. And then we also know that the maximum value is 4 root 2. Okay, so um, there's one other idea here that we're going to talk about, and it's the idea of um, looking at tangent planes to level surfaces. So we've already kind of talked about this, but we can now look at this from um, the perspective of using a gradient vector as well. Okay, so what it says here is the tangent plane to the level surface f of xyz is equal to k at the point, some point x0, y0, z0, and... Um, we can look at the plane that passes through the point P and has a, a normal vector, which is the gradient. So the gradient vector is always going to be normal to your tangent plane. 
And for using that then, we can write the equation of the tangent plane, just like we saw before, using the components of that gradient vector. So it's really exactly what we saw before, just understanding now that essentially if we do the dot product of our gradient vector with um, the change in our x, the change in our y, the change in our z, that's going to give us the equation of the plane. So it's just another way of representing exactly what we did before now that we've defined what a gradient vector is. Okay, so um, let's go through this example. It says find the equations of the tangent plane and the normal line at the point negative 2, 1, negative 3, and we're looking at the ellipsoid x squared over 4 plus y squared plus z squared over 9 is equal to 3. Okay, so if we're going to do this, um, what we need to know is, well, first of all, let's say you wanted to graph this. Um, you could go through and you could graph this and kind of get a feel for it. Now, notice they gave us that the ellipsoid is equal to 3. Um, that is sort of defining a specific, um, a specific, if we're thinking of this as sort of like a level curve or like a level surface, that's like a specific level surface for a function. So like, for example, I could say my function would be equal to x squared over 4 plus y squared plus z squared over 9. So that would be my function. And what we're doing is we're saying, OK, with that function, let's let k be equal to 3. And now we're looking at that level surface. OK, so the reason I wanted to do that is because I have to be able to take a partial derivative. And right when I'm looking at this form, you know, I'm really just looking at an equation. So now I've defined a function and defined that, OK, this is the function, but we're looking at this particular level surface of that function. OK, so let's take a look at our partials. So our x partial is 1 half x. Our y partial would be 2y. And our z partial would be 2z over 9. Now, I didn't really need to write that intermediate step. I could just write that as the gradient vector if I want to. Um, however, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's up to you to decide. So if you want to write, you know, gradient of f is equal to 1 half x comma 2y um, comma 2z over 9, you can do that as well. But I wrote it this way because I'm going to have to go through and I'm going to have to define all of these anyway. And again, you could write this in the gradient component as well. Uh, but if I evaluate that x partial at the point, I'm going to get negative 1. If I ev evaluate the y partial at the point, I'm going to get the value 2. And if I evaluate my z partial at that same point, I'm going to get negative 2 thirds. So it probably makes more sense to write those in the gradient form because it's going to be a little bit less writing. It's a little more concise, um, but it's up to you to decide. It doesn't really make a difference if it doesn't specifically say to write it in gradient form. OK, so we've, we already know how to do this, right? So this is the equation of a tangent plane. And by looking at it in this form, this is exactly what we did uh, back in section 14.4, I believe it was. So the only difference now is we can write it in gradient form. But to get the equation of the plane, I know I'm going to use the x partial, and then x minus x naught, so that'd be x plus 2, my y partial, times y minus y naught, so that'd be y minus 1, and then my z partial, times z minus z naught, that'd be z plus 3, and I know that's equal to 0. Okay, so there's the equation of my plane. So we can write it that way, or we could say, you know, if we want to rearrange this, 3x minus 6y, um, plus 2z plus 18 is equal to 0. Oops. Okay, so there's the equation of my plane. Now, if I want to write the normal line, the normal line is really easy to do because all I'm going to do is use the symmetric um, representation of the equation of the normal line. And what I can do is just do my x minus x naught, so x plus 2 over my change in the x direction. I can do my y minus y naught over the change in the y direction. And I can do my z minus z naught over the change in the z direction. 
Okay, so that would be the equation of my line. So this is my line. Okay, so pretty simple to do. Um, now, like I said, that's not really anything new other than the idea that we can now use the gradient form of the partial vectors to make it a little more concise. So, you know, think of that exact same process, but here I could have written that in gradient form, and here I could have written that in gradient form, and then this whole thing is just uh, my gradient dot product with my change in the x, change in y, change in z. Okay, so pretty simple. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the gradient vector. So when we're thinking about um, looking at a gradient vector, and we talked about that whole idea of having a um, maximum rate of change, well, when we're looking at a topo topographical um, representation of a function, we can think about the gradient vector and understand um, where we're going to have the fastest increase in our function value based on this topographical map just by going perpendicular to whatever curve we're looking at because the gradient vector is always going to be orthogonal to our level surface and we just saw that on the equation of the tangent plane so if that's the case you can see all of these points here where i want you know if i'm looking for a maximum rate of change all of those are going to be represented by um, the magnitude of my gradient vector at that particular point so that's what that allows us to do by understanding that relationship with the tangent plane Okay, so last problem here. It says a heat-seeking particle is located at the point 23 on a flat metal plate whose temperature at point xy is txy is 10 minus 8x squared minus 2y squared. Find an equation for the trajectory of the particle if it moves continuously in the direction of maximum temperature increase. So I want you to try this one. Keep in mind what we just talked about with finding the maximum change um, using the gradient vector. So keep in mind how that works and then see if you can get to the point where um, you understand what to do with the gradient vector. And then from there, um, I will show you my solution. This one's a little bit more challenging, but it's still using the same general premise. So I'll let you pause the video, try that one out. And when you come back, I'll show you the solution. Okay, so um, notice that we're looking at here. It says that um, we have a heat seeking particle located at the point 23 on a flat metal plate whose temperature is given by this um, and it says that it moves continuously in the direction of a maximum temperature increase so we're actually talking about a rate of change here when we're trying to think about our velocity function so our velocity function is going to be you know essentially the components of that temperature vector at whatever point we're at. So what I did was I just used K as sort of our, our general um, scalar multiple of that gradient vector. And so I've got my gradient as negative 16 X, negative four Y. And so my velocity is just essentially negative 16 K X, negative four K Y. And now if you notice there, what that gives me is my dx dt and my dy dt. Okay, so we know we're going to move in the direction of that maximum temperature increase. So I've got my dx dt, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to rearrange things so that I can go through and I can actually get an equation um, that will represent the trajectory. So I've got uh, my dx dt and my dy dt, I went ahead and solved for dt. Okay, so I have this representation of dx dt and dy dt, and what I'm looking for in the end is I'm looking for some kind of a path that I'm going to follow. And in order to find that, what I need to do is get an equation where I have y and x related together. So the way I'm going to do that is by eliminating a variable here. I solved both of those equations for dt. And by doing that, what that's going to allow me to do is it's going to allow me to set these two equations equal to each other. And now I get this relationship 
where I can just get a now a dy dx. dy dx is y over 4x. And then from there, this just turns into, you know, a calculus AB type of question where we've got a simple differential equation that we can solve by separation of variables. So I have dy dx is y over 4x. I know I want to go through the point 2, 3, separate my variables, integrate, solve for the constant value. And in the end, I end up with this path. So this is the path of, um, that's the direction of, uh, or excuse me, this is the equation for the trajectory if it moves in the direction of maximum temperature increase. So I've got y is equal to 3 over 2 to the 1 fourth times x to the 1 fourth power. Okay, so a little bit different type of question. Um, and you will see at the end of your assignment, you're going to get into some problems where it's not just these sort of rote type of, you know, simple plug into these algorithmic process type of questions. You'll have to think a little bit more to solve a couple of the questions at the end of the assignment. But for the most part, if you understand the basic idea of a directional derivative and the gradient and how to find the maximum um, change in the function value by using the direction or the magnitude of the directional derivative and then the direction, excuse me, the magnitude of the gradient vector and the direction of that gradient vector, then that's pretty much what you need to know. The rest of this just starts to get into, okay, now how do we use those ideas in, in sort of unique problem solving situations? Okay, so that's everything that I have for you here. There's a couple of little details that we'll go through during class, but for the most part, that should be everything you need to get started on the assignment.